Okay, everybody, welcome to today's webinar. I'm Joachim, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Radiant. And today we're going to be talking about efficient B2B sales in 2023. I have some other people with me and they are going to be introducing them themselves just in a short while. So the agenda of today is that we are going to be looking into what is the problem of achieving efficient sales. Then we have five simple do's and don'ts so that we can see how do we get efficient sales in 2023. You'll be able to have questions in the chat. And at the end, we will have a Q&A. So um, welcome, everyone. Let's take a deep dive into how to get efficient sales. So we all want to get efficient B2B sales every year. And 2023 is a bit different than what we've seen the past couple of years. Times are tougher, more cost focused. So how do we get some great sales despite of the market situation? To achieve this, we have five do's and don'ts. The first one we will dive into is about the segment. This is where Miko and Vinyl will come in. And we'll talk about how to align marketing and sales to achieve efficient B2B sales. And we'll also dive into the channels that we're going to be using in order to get efficient B2B sales. And of course, also bringing in some of the practical sales efforts to be efficient in the sales. Then we're going to be looking into the existing client base and how we can utilize and monetize our existing clients for sales. Miku, the floor is yours. Thanks, Joachim, and hi, everyone. So Mikko is my name. I'm one of the co-founders of Bainu. We, we build and maintain a company database and, of course, integrate with, with HubSpot. I'm working these days as a product manager for the global database. Uh, let's talk about segments. For me, it, it really means that all of us, we need to be good at defining our ideal customer profile. So we need to know the type of customers we want to sell to and the type of customers we want to work with. And of course, not only the type of companies, but also the buyer personas. Um, a couple of do's um, regarding ICP. I think for all of us, it would be very important that we use, of course, the existing sales data that we have so that we know what type of customers actually buy from us. If you look at hit rates and, and conversion rates, most likely you can quite easily uh, detect and identify different type of segments. Some of them outperform others. Uh, one, one tip is also to not only look at sales like new business data, but also look at existing customers like renewal data, retention data. We have done lots of that type of exercises at, at Vinu and, and we know that for example, uh, companies that use HubSpot, that's definitely a segment that outperforms many other uh, uh, segments. So using both sales data and CS data is very important. And then uh, if you orchestrate, I, I would imagine many people in the audience orchestrate their go-to-market in, in, in HubSpot. So that's a good place to then share these ICPs uh, with all the teams because it's so important that uh, CS product finance, sales, ops, all these teams that they have the same definition of the segments that they want to that they want to go after. Uh, quite often, I'm also involved in quite a few other SaaS startups, and I, I see one pitfall, and that's the don't part. Um, when, when you get a good flying start with the initial ICP, very often you start expanding and extending the ICP. And I guess the thinking goes that if the total addressable market gets bigger, sales will grow. But actually, quite often, it's exactly the opposite. I feel that hit rates and conversions go down if you start expanding too quickly. So my, my tip is to really focus on uh, the ICP you know, and um, maybe it's even better to narrow it down instead of extending it, because then you can really make sure that you build and create value for that, for that segment. And I had a question for you, Joachim, if you go back to the previous slide, yes. Um, you actually did it 
So you at Radiant, you narrowed down the ICP and I can see that you then saw an increase in hit rate. Maybe you can briefly mention what was that all about? Yeah. Yeah. So um, since the market has changed um, the past six months, we have been focusing even more on narrowing down the client base and the ICP and target markets on behalf of our clients. Um, it's really been quite extreme now, but uh, even though there's far less uh, targets, potential targets and potential clients, we see a higher hit rate and uh, eventually also a higher win rate. So I can definitely uh, recommend to be focusing more uh, uh, and, and disqualifying a lot of the potential market because if you go too broad, it just hurts your co customer acquisition cost. Exactly, exactly. And I think CRM, if we go to the next slide, um, CRM is really a gold mine um, when it comes to detecting these segments or clusters or ICP, whatever name you use, um, because you can, of course, quite easily look at the data and start seeing that, hey, this is the segment we seem to uh, be very successful and we have high hit rate. And you might also see that, hey, we have actually lots of opportunities and deals going on with this segment, but we're not really closing anything. And then if you include also the retention data and renewal data, you start seeing that, hey, this segment, yes, we're able to sell to it, but they're not really uh, uh, having very high lifetime value, for example. So CRM data is, is very good. When I started in B2B sales myself uh, 15 years ago, there was always one habit when I saw some, when I closed a deal, then I often went to Google and I wanted to find lookalikes. And that's actually something that is happening in B2C all the time. As we know, there's lots of lookalike audiences that marketeers are using. And now, nowadays, I feel that you can do exactly the same in the context of B2B as well, because we have so much data and there's also lots of AI models these days. So what we have been working very hard lately is to bring lookalike audience and lookalike data, similarity data uh, into our um, CRM. We use, we use HubSpot. So already for us, we use it internally and soon releasing it as well. But at the moment when you close a deal, you can easily see out of all those like more than 70 million companies worldwide, what are the best and most similar lookalikes. So whenever you close a deal, you can go after exactly the same type of customers. Or when you have an awesome meeting, when you see a colleague is doing business in another country, using and applying a certain use case, it's super easy. But this name... This data needs to be available for salespeople so that they don't have to go to Google. They don't have to leave the CRM. And that's why we're putting this data inside um, inside HubSpot and using these in-app features that HubSpot these days, these days have. So I think CRM is a goldmine, not only using sales data, but also the customer success, retention and renewal data, and then making it very easy for salespeople to actually use and this is a good way to make sure that they focus on the same ICP um, and also that they sort of scale that approach by being very effective and going after all of them because they're available uh, in front of them. Yeah, and I know for a fact that not only you have the possibilities of the lookalikes directly within the CRM, but also knowing when to strike, when to target those. I don't know if you can say a few words about that, Miko. Yeah. I mean, obviously, timing is is very important um, in 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 sales, and I think in a way you could also think of lookalikes that sometimes it's not only these company um, characteristics that define the uh, the similarity. Sometimes it's the sort of the journey they're in. For example, if they're about to expand to a new country, they're about to implement a new technology. I mean, then the situation is similar to other companies. And that can also be uh, used in your uh, go-to-market tactics if you know that your service is always needed when a certain sort of trigger event is, is happening. So I think all these things make a lot of sense because you're increasing the likelihood that you end up speaking with the potential customer uh, at the right point of time. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Miko. Um, then we're going to be talking about another and do and don't, and it's about aligning sales and marketing. Um, so I will actually start off with, with, with the don't. So at the moment, the prices of hard conversion lead generation ads has incre increased quite a bit. We've seen this 
on 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 the basis of our, of our own clients that it's just getting gotten really expensive so how do you overcome this when you also have a direct sales effort um, we've seen that adding priming for both top and bottom funnel targets is a really efficient way of generating that awareness towards that specific target market that Miku just talked about. They will look at vinyl, they will look at your brand, and, and, and they will become aware of this in a way cheaper uh, me method uh, instead of hard conversion ads. And this goes in, in the same way of your bottom funnel. So on, on your pipeline, you can even make sure that within uh, specific stages of, of your pipeline, uh, you can prime those targets with cheap awareness and, and make sure that your brand comes first when they're making the choice um, in terms of purchasing or not. Another thing is, is tapping into uh, uh, super trends and trends in general. And Jaka, I know Pio Jaka, we have an important question just before you proceed. Um, somebody's asking, what is priming? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> priming is, is a way of uh, generating awareness towards a market. Um, it is ads, just like lead generating ads, but it's more focused on brand awareness rather than some converting ad form. Um, so it's more brand awareness, really, but a specific brand awareness towards your specific target market that you are going to be engaging in both top and bottom funnel. Um, so that's priming. Um, and in terms of, of uh, value propositions and unique selling points, pair from contract book, we'll get into this in, in, in just a moment, but it's really important that you also tap into these super trends. Also, when you work within sales, the market is what the market is. Use it, utilize it to be efficient and monetize, uh, to be proactive, uh, talking with clients about these trends and making sure that you have content with marketing that is snackable, easy to, 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 to use, um, and is relevant for these niche markets that, that Miku just talked about. So overall, priming your second relevance is, is really important and will lift your business and generate more revenue in a cheaper and more efficient way rather than, for example, lead hard converting uh, lead generation ads. So Miku, I know that in Vinu, you're also working with marketing and sales alignment. Um, how do you align marketing and sales right now? Yeah, a couple of concrete things. I think the easy one is, of course, that if if they, to some extent at least, share the same KPIs, I think revenue is is a, is a good one. I mean, then then you end up speaking the same same language. So I would at least think of shared uh, KPIs, so that you don't measure marketing only based on number of leads, but you actually look at the look at the revenue generated. Uh, then also simply spending time together. We just spent two days in 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 Stockholm this week where we discussed mainly like sales and customer success goals and targets and, 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 and plans. But of course, Armer, who's running our marketing, was involved and included because they play an important role in hitting those numbers. And then I think the one that we often, it's easy to miss, is that marketing needs to be very hands-on with customers. I know, Armer, we, we do call recordings, so we record sales meetings and customer meetings. I would imagine uh, our marketing team is is they're among the most active users of that software. So they actually listen in lots of those uh, recordings so that they understand customers and, and, and prospects. And also sales is to some extent involved in marketing. They can create content and uh, they, they, they're sort of doing the same thing. So I think learning what the others are doing and really doing it together, that's a good way to improve the alignment. Also, you could, of course, think of... Uh, them reporting to the same person quite often there's uh, some sort of uh, chief revenue officer and then marketing and sales are both reporting to the same person another good way to increase alignment absolutely hi everyone uh, my name is pierre i'm uh, heading up our partnership growth at country book and for the for, for you that don't know what contrabook is it's a it's a best in class innovative contract lifecycle management solution trying to unify the whole contract journey from contract creation to post signature. But right now it's all about the value proposition, which is a super important element in every sales. So what we want to talk about here is that in order to, to, to cut through the whole overflow of information 
that's out there when you want to talk to companies you need to adapt and address the value proposition to your audience and you need to first of all make it value based that is so important so for the past 5 10 years it's been much about growth hyper growth top line revenue but today that's not how the current market landscape looks like so it needs to be a lot more value driven you need to look at the company that you're reaching out to you need to know who they are you need to know what their pains are what are the challenges what are their needs behind the needs and who are who, who's the persona that you're talking to because that's very individual as well as to what their needs and challenges are so that's step one so once you have that in place you naturally need to differentiate yourself not just from competition but also in terms of that specific solution that you're trying to solve for that specific company and if you're not doing it in, in an authentic way if you put on the autopilot which is easy to do especially when you have a lot of pressure coming from the outside from management and so forth you will more likely miss out on that sales because that is something that the the company can feel so you really need to have that sense of authenticity when you talk to the clients you need to care about who they are and you want to solve their problems not just now but also in the long term and all of these things you you need to tap into what Joachim also talked about before the trends the super trends to make it as relevant as possible so again it doesn't become this noise of just another pitch but it's super relevant and today we can take an example as in country book uh, we're in an amazing journey it's been a lot about growth growth and growth it still is but the market has also changed a little bit the dynamics so we also need to consider the cost the efficiency the resources that the companies have available today and kind of adapt our value proposition to address those super trends that is more or less um uh, relevant for every company today but I'm also interested, Joachim, to know, like, how, how do you see this uh, in your role? Yeah, well, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, clients, especially SaaS and tech clients that are um, adopting these super trends, communicating uh, value propositions into these super trends. For example, th this very cost focused area we are in in the market right now, but they do it, you know, mostly within their new products and new services, and they really forget to uh, make sure that the, their existing and older services and products, that these value propositions from these products are tapping into super trends. And we see that uh, most of our clients completely forget, forget about this. And then there are existing and old services and products, which is driving most of their revenue, becomes less relevant in this market. So mm. we help clients making sure that you know, they can tap into these super trends and be relevant uh, within these markets. I think it's a very good point that it's not just new products, but it's also the existing ones. That that's a that's a really good takeaway to remember that. Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's uh, then dive into uh, do's and don't number three, and this is about channels. And bear in mind, there's a lot of text on on this slide. Uh, but first of all, I will talk about uh, um, that you will have more and more touch points with clients uh, before you you can actually make a sale. And a lot of clients will prefer the digital ways of communicating and digital channels. But before just diving into the adoption of multiple, multiple channels, then please just bear in mind that have a look at your own business and your own product and your own pricing. Because as we see also from, from Gartner here uh, at the top, if you have a, a product or service that is quite highly priced and has a high complexity, then actually a majority of your client base would prefer a traditional way of selling, um, especially if it's the first time you engage with a client. So bear that in mind. If you, on the other hand, have a, a product or services offering that has a, a lower price point, uh, a lower value point, and is, is less complex and more generic, then you can move more towards digital self-serve and, and just making sure that you meet the clients where they want to engage uh, with you. So, so diversify your channels based upon this complexity, based upon the stage and based upon the pricing and make sure that you have a platform to actually integrate and enable these channels 
Um, so we see a lot of uh, um, clients that, uh, of course, they have a tech stack within marketing, sales, and customer success, for example. And it's fine that it's not the same platform, but then at least make sure it's integrated so you can learn from those interactions. We've all experienced the, uh, the pains of communicating with clients uh, uh, when generating a deal through LinkedIn, uh, mail, phone, uh, WhatsApp, text messages. And it's, it's just a, a, a web of communication that is really hard to coordinate and, and make sure that you have all of the information. So adopt it within the same platform or integrate it really well. And then, of course, use the hybrid sales and the community and, and partner channels to stimulate your target market, just like we're doing here today. Uh, uh, you know, we have four companies uh, assembled today to talk about the same things so that we can create the legitimacy uh, towards our uh, common uh, target market that are you, you the audience today, um, because a single channel does not work anymore. Um, I think it's quite obvious. Um, so adopt it um, and, and use it. Um, and when you're looking at the don'ts, you know, what shouldn't you do? Uh, well, then don't forget about the in-person uh, communication, right? So we've seen within B2B, 59% of potential buyers, they, they, they don't want to buy anything from you if they haven't met you at least one time in person, uh, even if it's physical or you know, in, on, on a Teams meeting, for example. But I know that uh, you, Miko, and, and Vino are also using a lot of different channels here and adopting hybrid sales and, and, and partner channels. But how do you do it at Vino? Yeah, I think we, we do definitely. And, and I think it's important that often it has to, be the, has to be the customer who sort of decides which channel they want to use and then we need to serve them in, in, in that channel. So if they prefer face-to-face -face meeting, if they prefer free trial, if they prefer doing research by themselves, some people want to speak with individuals, some people actually use a phone a lot, some people Google Meets, some people are active on LinkedIn. So I think you just need to track lots of things and see where they prefer to have that type of communications. And because it has to be, of course, timely and, 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 and fast. That was interesting. I actually had a meeting this this morning. There was one one company. Uh, they had created new new properties in in HubSpot contact properties, and uh, basically, I think they were using some sort of Myers Briggs personality types. So they 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 profiled individuals if they're extrovert or introvert, if they're sort of more sensing versus feeling, and then based on that, they defined if they if they push, for example, a meeting or if they push a free trial. So I think there's lots of that type of thinking uh, going on as well. And, and the more data you have, you can also not only profile companies, but you can also profile in individuals. But I think I think the at the end of the day, most likely it's the customer who decides the channel. And then as, as, a, as a vendor, you need to orchestrate your own team that you can serve them in that channel and uh, when they the channel they want and also when they when they want. Yeah. So when you know your client and their preferences within your target mm. market, you can prioritize those channels and then make it cost efficient and don't adapt, you know, channels that are, is not relevant for your audience and target market, right? Yep. And I think one, one, one more thing, uh, when we create like sales pipeline, uh, I think most companies create pipeline stages um, starting from their sort of own point of view. They may, might say that, okay, first meeting, held uh, proposal in the making this is a making phase but you could also think of it from the customer point of view like what's actually the states they are in that potential buying buying journey and then i think you get new ideas also regarding the channels and, and how to serve them so I, I think that's a good action point and exercise look at your own pipeline stages in your in your hubspot and uh, is it reflecting your own sales playbook or is it reflecting the actual uh, buying journey good point Good point. So Sharon, I know you're up now. Yes, and I'm just um, very interested in, in Miko's uh, point in relation to profiling your, your prospects and customers along the way so that you are always addressing them at their stage in their own buyer's journey. 
Um, hi folks, my name is Sharon. I'm a channel account manager here in HubSpot. I think most of us know HubSpot is the number one CRM platform for growing companies. So look, thank you all for taking the time to, to come and see and talk to us here today. What we wanna look at here for a few minutes is about confidence, about confidence in your customer with your sales, about how you take that prospect from being say a lead to a qualified lead to a prospect to a customer and then to a promoter of your products and services. They need to be as confident as possible in you as a person and in your products and services and in your company. Um, I'm a long time in sales and one of the things I learned very many years ago, I think in my own yellow pages days, was that people buy from people that they trust and that sales is a process. It is a, what we, we were taught in yellow pages, it is the logical thought process that anybody goes through before making a positive decision to buy. So that still holds true today. But what's different about today is that that logical thought process before people make that positive decision to buy has become more complex. There's an awful lot of more things coming at people. So the opportunity to become a little bit confused, the opportunity to have an awful lot of choice is all there. So as salespeople, it's our role to help take that lead prospect customer promoter through their own buyer's journey at their own stage so that at each stage they are confident in the decisions that they're going to be making based on the information and help that you're going to be given to them. One of the things that we do here in HubSpot is we, we look at how to become that high trust advisor to the lead the prospect, the customer, and then the, the promoter. So that at every stage that that person, because they are a human, has confidence in the decision that they made to make that purchase with you and with your salespeople. So what we can look at here now is six key success factors of being that high trust advisor. And let's remember that at each of the different stages of that buyer's journey, all six of these skills come into play. They're not going to be a skill that's assigned to any one of the particular stages of the buyer's journey. It's something that is going to enable that prospect, customer, promoter, or lead be confident in the decision that they made based on the relationship that they've built with your salesperson, your company, and your product and service. Per, in, uh, in contract book. Yes. So with with, the, with the, the value that you add to the marketplace and the salespeople that you have, which of these six would you, would you think is most important? Well, well, first, first of all, um, all six are naturally super yeah. important. And I also think now that we are talking about practical sales, it's, it's very important to recognize that although this is what we all should aim at achieving, it is not that you're going to succeed with it every time, but this is a super great foundation um, to remind you about what you need to do in order to be that trusted advisor and that people buy from other people. But when that's said and done, I think what we are trying to do you said pick one. That's so, that's very difficult, uh, Sharon. Uh, I want to pick them all, but um, if I can pick two, uh, then I would probably go for the integrity. Uh, we want to practice what we preach. Uh, that creates trust because if you don't do what you're promising, then that will naturally not create trust. So that's that's a really important first step. And secondly, the uh, authenticity about really putting yourself in your customers or prospect shoes and more or less feeling what they're feeling in terms of their pains and their challenges and how you are able to solve them, not just now, but in the long term. I think those are the two most important factors that we are also trying to live by. Can I can I mention one one thing? Uh, a little bit ad hoc comment. Uh, but the, there's an interesting, I've been doing sales myself and, and I've had different titles uh, when I started my career I guess I was business development manager I've been AE and uh, uh, many different titles uh, a few years ago I started working with a product so I'm product manager uh, and something something interesting happened nowadays when I joined the meetings I think there's some sort of additional trust or confidence happening simply because because of that like title change that you come 
with the product background. And I think mm. it's, it's interesting how could all AEs, for example, have that same effect? Uh, because of course, we don't want to use any, any fake titles or anything like that. But simply when you bring in like somebody from the products or from data or solutions engineer, they often seem to have a little bit extra uh, trust uh, regarding the actual solution. And I think that's an interesting action point to think how AEs can work and act that they can they can increase. I think maybe the answer is here in these six six bullets. But it's it was quite obvious that you were sort of extremely welcome for every meeting when you have some sort of product title because then people feel that okay this person is only about solving the the problems that I have and it it has nothing to do with sales. If That's I could jump point. in there, Miko, I think what might be helpful there as well is in addition to having a nice fancy title, and we'd all love to have nice fancy titles, but as you said there, you know, we still do have to make sure that we are um, authentic about what our titles mm. actually are. But I, what I picked up there, and I do think this is really, really important, and this will wrap around all the six things that we have here and some of the things that we've been saying before, is that for that prospect to become a customer, to become the promoter, to be confident into making that purchase is back to you, the salesperson, uh, who's usually the front line or the first person that the first human to human conversation that they will have. But that person to really go that extra mile, listen hard, you know, the old analogy of two ears and one mouth, you know, listen, 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 and ask the questions that are addressing the problem that they have, dig more deeply into what actually is that problem so that we're solving for the right problem and then bring the right expertise or the right resources to the meetings that you have. So as a salesperson in HubSpot, if I'm dealing with a complicated prospect who has a very, who has a complicated integrations that I don't have the skill set to address, I will bring a sales engineer to that call. Why? Because that's the right thing to do to solve the problem that that prospect has. Because if I was to have a fancy title and a big ego, I wouldn't bring a sales engineer, I would deal with the prospect myself. But that would leave me vulnerable because I don't have that skill set. I am a salesperson, I am not a sales engineer. So, you know, wear the title, my title properly and bring that expertise to the call. And that will then instill in my prospect the confidence that um, the sales engineer will address those complexities, those migrations, those integrations questions and his problem is being solved the right way by the right people. Yeah, I think it makes makes a lot of sense because so many products and services can be tried out um, as a without really speaking to anyone. And then what we have left for sales is more complex solutions where you need consultative approach. So I think people, buyers expect lots of that type of know-how. So it's an interesting uh, decision when and how to bring sales engineer, just like you said, so yeah. fully, fully agree. And to answer that, your that question, is... Jessica, Jessica, an AE is an account executive. It could be, there could have been many, many different letters attached to that. I mean, we're a, we're a world of letters. In HubSpot, we call an AE a GS, which is a growth specialist. At the end of the day, they're a salesperson. And I, I truly believe also, Sharon, that in most, most cases, uh, you become the trusted advisor with the help of your team, not just on Absolutely. your, most in sales are journalists, which is great, like they... They, they open the doors, they figure out what the needs and the pains are, but that trust is then created when you show that that you are vulnerable in a sense, in meaning that you have your limitations as well, and you need help and you bring in the specialist. So very true. Yep. And that will then, as I said, you know, generate that confidence that that prospect has, that you are selling the right solution to the, for the right reasons based on the right intelligence and the right information. Yeah, let's have a deep dive into the more practical matter of this. Instilling confidence uh, for our clients is really important. So what you will need to do in practical sales is to uh, adopt sense making, uh, helping client navigating through the overload of information that is available out there, especially in these times where you know the usage, the mass usage of AI like ChatGPT has become the norm, and the relevant and quality information out there is 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 very good, and there's a lot of it. So. How does a client navigate through the landscape of this overload of information? Now your position as a salesperson 
um, is actually changing a lot because you will need to help the clients navigate through that landscape rather than telling them what to do or telling them what they need. Um, or, or, or just provide them with what they need. You need to navigate them through the landscape and you need to be able to use a, a pitch model in every engagement that, that I will explain in, in just a minute uh, in terms of being unique and, and, and addressing problems and trends and solution and the fear of missing out. And you need to adopt the hybrid selling to increase the amount of touch point to that specific target market to instill that confidence with more touch points and navigate the client through the overload information. And then you always have to remember, you know, do not pitch the product, pitch the problem. And, and this is something we can all learn, even as a co-founder, when I uh, pitch Radiant, if it's in a sales meeting or sales call, email, whatever, I introduce myself. Well, let's start off with the problem, right? Because this is why we have a business. This is why uh, we have relevance. So pitch in the problem, not the product at least. So how do you, how do, you do this? Well, we've uh, created a, a five-point pitch model in order to stay relevant in this market uh, situation. Always start out to demonstrate that you know the client is unique using some tools like AI tools, helping you to create sentences and, and, and get that information in order to, to, um, to showcase that you know the client, for example, a tool like Vino, so that you have the relevant information, communicate the information and then address the problems initially that your business and your product are solving. Not the product first, but the problem that you're solving. And, and this is whether you're on the phone or in the sales meeting, whatever, introducing yourself, this model can be adopted in all manners, even on a CXO level and management position. And then tap into the trends, address the trends, and then come in with the solution, right? How does the solution fit into the problem and into the trend and into this unique client? Um, and if you're within a marketplace that is very generic and competitive, also just be proactive and add the differentiation that your product and solution have when you've addressed problem and trends first. And then of course, the fear of missing out is extremely effective. So now you've demonstrated, you know the client, you address the problems that you're solving, that the client have the problem, that these problems are relevant in, in, in the super trends and that your solution can solve these problems. Then address how you have solved such problems for companies just like them, the lookalikes that Miku talked about, for example, because the fear of missing out is really effective. They want to know that other businesses similar to them have faced these problems and that you have solved it. So adopt this pitch model in every manner of your, your sales efforts. Then if we look into the existing client base, of course, there's huge potential in terms of sales and efficient sales when looking into the uh, existing client base. First of all, you need to adopt the same commercial platform as Nubis, or at least integrate it very well and then prioritize sales uh, towards the most happiest clients. And then you might say, well, this is for customer success. This is not for sales. Yeah, to, uh, to an extent it is, but the interconnection between the existing clients and the learnings, values, and problems from the existing clients can be monetized really well towards new business uh, um, and existing clients in general. We all know that, at least we've experienced that a lot of clients, they have a far superior structure in terms of upselling and, and, and new business selling towards new potential clients than they have of those of their existing clients, even though it's far cheaper to, to, to sell to existing clients. So use and adopt the uh, uh, monetization of existing clients' behavior and readiness, and then adjust the pitch model a bit because your existing clients, they, they don't want to hear that much about the why, but rather the how and the who and the FOMO when you communicate. So what you shouldn't do here is to separate separate existing client data with new business client data. And I think that in seven or uh, seven out of 10 times when we engage with, with clients here at Radiant, especially within tech and, and, and SaaS, they don't have the same adopted data for existing clients and new business clients, and they don't have the same structure 
are mon monitoring the, the, the behavior in the same way. And as we can see, well, it really makes sense that using the same methodology, adjusted a bit, same platform, same data, can increase your sales efforts quite a bit. And if I could just add something, Jorgen? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. So from previous experience, what works really great here is that if there's a like very low practical approach is that if you have your customer experience, your customer success management team and an account management team working closely together, uh, the, the customer success managers being the eyes and ears out there, having that day-to-day -day relationship with the clients, and then the account management more on the commercial side, once they work together, they are able to take the existing portfolio of clients and maybe map them out as the most uh, happy clients, create more stickiness to them, add more value to them by being this trusted advisor. But this is also a great opportunity to look at the ones that are maybe not so active if you're selling a SaaS platform, for instance, and try to engage with them some more because there might be a reason that they're not uh, using the platform so much and you need to figure out what that is and if you can make them even more active and do that upsell. A hundred percent. And we see that if the new biz uh, reps have the learnings that is adopted from existing clients that are actually using the product, uh, using the value, having the problems, they get far more relevant towards the target market. So that was it in terms of the five do's and don'ts. Um, now we have time for questions and, and answers. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to start out with uh, a question or two. Well, Jochen, we had a quite a few questions in the chat pane, so will I call them out? Yeah, so let me let's just do it. Back. Okay. Um, so Anthony has a question, and you mentioned the word right at the beginning. You mentioned the word clusters. What are you? What are your thoughts on leveraging CRM da data to perform statistical analysis? Yeah, I can take that. Um, well, I think it makes makes a lot of sense. I mean, there's different models. Uh, for example, the way we do it when we detect and identify clusters we actually look at mainly the the website content then we use embeddings or vectors if you will and we look at the dist basically those embeddings are words and phrases and then we analyze uh, sort of the websites that are very similar then on top of that i think you can also apply some of the crm data um, or other company data like um, location size and maybe even internal data like existing customer yes or no uh, what products they use and so on but i think it, i think the most interesting part of the similarity is to understand what are the companies that are sort of doing the same thing providing same type of services and maybe applying same type of go-to-market tactics and that's what we try to solve with um, with these clusters and similarity model yeah and we've also had a clients that I can give you a concrete example, a client within FinTech that needs to serve um, a larger medium and enterprise clients that have the need of uh, engaging with ESG and reporting on ESG this year. And from their annual reports, you can actually um, uh, scrape data when they communicate something about ESG that is relevant and similar to their existing client base. So we set that up uh, by using a, a tool, uh, for example, like a uh, Vinu, so that they engage with clients that have that specific need and they get a notification. Now there's a new potential client that has just written this freshly in their annual report, go engage. That's pretty cool. Okay, Celine has a question. Um, referring back to finding lookalike data using your existing CRM customer base, would you recommend the technique of emailing these lookalike companies to introduce your business? I can also quickly comment. I mean, it depends on your own go-to market tactics, I guess. Uh, one use case that we've been using a lot is that whenever you get a uh, case study out, of course, that case study most likely resonates uh, best with companies that are sort of similar to that company that is mentioned in the case study. So for example, when we create ads and personalize uh, content, we tr try to pick that type of example. So we basically, they, uh, potential customers see customer stories of their own lookalikes. Then um, I think it depends on the salesperson when we bring these lookalikes in front of salespeople, 
like if you close a deal and then you get all these lookalikes i mean might be phone might be email but i think that's more depends on your own sales playbook what you have decided uh, as a channel or first outreach method absolutely we've also tried to take this to the extreme i come from uh, originally from deloitte prior to creating radiant um so we have a lot of clients that are partner driven so we actually did the similar thing and showcasing when we engage with a specific partner for a specific type of business then for the priming the brand awareness they were actually uh being um exposed for that specific partner person on the ads to 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 create that um uh, trust. Nice, nice. Okay, Pete has a question. Um, how would you scale up the VP and problem solving so you're not personalizing outreach to every prospect? That's a good. That's a good question, Pete. Um, of course, it depends a lot on the complexity of your product and who your ICPs are. But again, if you need to personalize it to everyone, that's going to be uh, very time consuming. Uh, so probably not realistic in, in the real world. But again, doing the segmentation, um, maybe having these clusters of, of different ICP verticals, then you can more or less adapt your value proposition to those companies that you're reaching out to. But I think where their value proposition really come into place as well is once you have that conversation with the client one-to-one uh, -one, either in a physical meeting or online that's where you can really personalize it so if the very first outreach um there you need to have some other tools in your toolbox to to, to break through the door uh, i think one of the most efficient ways to doing this is when you um, uh, doing your segmentation to watch your target market. It's a lot about structuring in different target lists that are enabled with different USPs and VPs. And the structuring within your CRM is really, really important because then you can far easier be even more relevant and, and thus uh, lift your uh, revenue, right? Uh, um, so structuring in different sets within your CRM that's efficient way of doing it. Anthony has a question. Uh, what are your thoughts on channels such as distributors or representatives? Does it hurt the value proposition by complexifying the whole journey? Good word, complexifying is a new one to me. Well, um, complexifying. Of course, you, you need to be looking at what type of product um, are you actually selling? Um, because if you have a high complexity product, then distributors can be very efficient because they can be specialists within an area. So taking, for example, a SaaS company that are selling a GRC or ESG solution, well, then you have specialists that can distribute these SaaS products, uh, for example, like big consultancies, and with, they have silos that know exactly about the problems. Um, so um, it depends on the product complexity. Yeah, I can, I can also comment briefly. I'm involved in, in a few other companies, and some of them have, for example, uh, investors in the board, and we discuss these topics often. I, I think... The important thing is that you can't do, especially if you're small, you need to pick and choose how you do your go to market because then you need to be really good at it. So, for example, if you decided to do um, inside sales, then maybe there's no point to do an ecosystem play or work with partners and, and resellers a lot because especially at the beginning, you need to be very good at what you do. Uh, but then it might be that for some products, it makes a lot of sense that you pick that I'll work with resellers or I'll build it fully around a marketplace, for example. But then I would really focus. So I think the question is really, uh, can you stay focused, whatever you decide, and uh, try to be extremely good at that before you try doing lots of things at the same time? And you can easily end up being just okay in all of them. Yeah, not only being a focus, but also choosing what is the time frame that you have, right? Yeah. So uh, uh, depending on the channel, the time frame is either shorter or longer. Uh, so take, for example, the concrete um, example here is uh, at Radiant, we're partners with, with Vino, Contract Book, and HubSpot. 
it takes a lot of time to cultivate and, and make that uh, make it happen, you know, getting a growth together. Um, so the time frame of that is is pretty long. Uh, whereas, you know, direct sales, for example, the time frame is is far shorter. Um, so uh, efficiency, time frame, yeah, you need to you need to mix it up and, and pick. Okay, I think we probably have time for maybe two more. Um, so how would you handle, uh, my, Marianne asks, how would you handle an organization that you know has a high fit with your solution, but puts their trust in an external advisor rather than interacting with you directly? I can, I can, I can start. Um, I think it's, first of all, it's, I think, I would think, can we also, have an impact on who the external advisor is. So I think it's a big opportunity to proactively connect uh, like your raving fans or your promoters with potential buyers so that if they need to speak with others, that you're actively playing a role of connecting potential buyers with some of your best and most happy happy customers so i think you can still impact uh, that quite a bit but it, again it has to be in the playbook otherwise it won't won't happen okay so we have can you repeat what priming means shortly priming also... means using advertising for brand awareness towards a specific target market not being focused on generating leads from that ad. Okay. And what adapt, adopting multi-channels means? Is it creating channels in HubSpot for different segments? It means that when you pick a channel to engage with, phone, email, LinkedIn, chat, text messages, WhatsApp, whatever, um, distributors, uh, whatever you do, partners, uh, community channels, um, then you need to pick that of those that fits the target market and the preferences of your target market. And that is what adopting channel is all uh, channels is all about. Not just, you know, telling yourself that you need to uh, be using all channels available because as Miko and I just talked about, that will be really expensive. So you need to pick upon um, the channels that is relevant for your target market, your business model, um, and then prioritize and focus on those channels. And then maybe also just adding to the traditional channels, uh, which is of course inbound and outbound, then the whole partnership channel like we're doing today, it's also really, really strong uh, low cost of getting new clients in because you use your entire ecosystem, your whole network of assets, people, connections around you. And it also creates a lot faster from experience that, that trust because someone else is recommending on your behalf that this is already a great product. So you're already two steps ahead from competition often when you have that approach and kind of try to um, include that in your go-to-market strategy. So often in many companies, it's still a very untapped territory, but uh, highly recommendable to look into. Yeah, and just, just consider the time frame because it is really cost-efficient uh, partnership channels, right? But it takes a lot of time to cultivate and build up uh, that growth. And it can be very, very hard to um to measure um but it, it creates a lot of uh, legitimacy yeah Re regarding the question about priming i actually these days always have my chat gpt tab open so that i can have a discussion so whenever there's a new term or something i'm always actually uh, engaging with that and asking what does priming mean in the context of b2b marketing for example so just copy pasted the answer in the q a as well Life hack. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> nice. Okay, uh, we uh, five, we're at nine twenty-five. My time, ten twenty-five. Everybody else's time. Will we wrap up, or would you like one more question? Let's have one more. Okay, you'll like this one, Joachim. What is the best sales slash customer success team structure for small companies? From Peter. 
I, I think impossible to answer it comes down to the um how you actually sell do you have like inside sales team or plg model it depends on the uh, average uh, price point um, acb uh, it comes down to client acquisition cost i think the only rule of thumb that i can think of is to keep it simple and start uh, if you're in the software space that you need to track uh, net retention net revenue retention meaning the renewal renewal rate from day one not only new business sales but also you need to track uh, cs customer success figures early on but the org structure i think you have to think of your go-to-market tactics average contract value the product how complex or easy to use it is and and so on but keep it simple that's that's my tip yeah and i i would also add that there are general things that could make uh, use of more efficient sales when you're a very small company in the start placing your founders and management in front of clients as much as possible in the start. We can see that from our data on behalf of our clients that are small, that the win rate is far superior and it is cheaper to, um, uh, to get revenue uh, when having the management positioned in front of clients. Mm -hmm. and, and, and where it gets more expensive is the phase that you can no longer engage with clients because you, you, you get larger and larger. And that is really expensive to then have AEs and other people uh, actually bring in, in, bring in uh, the, the sales. So that is one efficient way of um, making sure you get enough sales. Okay, and that wraps up our questions for this morning. Well, then um, thank you everyone for attending today. It's been a pleasure. Uh, you will receive all of the material and the recording of today. If you have any questions at all for Vinyl, Contract Book, Hotspot or Radiant, well, reach out to myself, Joachim, Miko from Vinyl, Pierre from Contract Book and Sharon from Hotspot. <laughs>